Hello and welcome to the second in our series of lectures in Western Civilization. I'm going to be picking up where we left off previously and talking about the Protestant Reformation. And we're going to be talking about the development of a Protestantism in Europe. Now, normally in a lecture setting, what I would do is I would go through some examples of uh, the various Protestant churches, such as Lutheran and Calvin. But as this is a different kind of format, uh, I'm going to instead forego those and focus on the development of Anglicanism. It's more exciting in my opinion, um, and it's, I'm more interested in it myself, so I'm going to go through and do that. Now, also what I sometimes will do in the classroom setting is for the development of the Lutheran Church. There is a wonderful video on YouTube that you can find that is on the life of Luther and how his life uh, assists him in developing the Protestant Reformation. And I would encourage you to try and find that and look that up. But it's Anglicanism that we are going to focus in on for this particular lecture. And the development of Anglicanism in England is primarily through the life story of Henry VIII. So I'm going to be going through Henry VIII's life. Now to understand Henry, Henry VIII, we've got to go back a little bit uh, to the War of the Roses. Not too far back, but a little far back. Now the War of the Roses was a kind of civil war in England as to who, which family it was that was going to be the king. It was between that of the Lancasters and the Yorks. The uh, Yorks represented by Edward IV and the Lancasters by Henry VI. Now that these two monarchs, Henry VI, Edward IV, vie back and forth as to who sits on the throne. One will rise up, overthrow the other, and seize. But eventually, Henry VI dies, and Edward is left on the throne. Unfortunately, he also will die. And that will leave his young son, who's about 13 at the time, Edward, to become the new monarch. But he is not in London at the time, and so he travels to London to be coronated, to be crowned. Along the way, his uncle, Richard will kidnap him, ostensibly for protection. Oh, I've got to protect you. There are things that are dangerous out there, and you're still not a man yet, so I will care for you. Now, it's still debatable as to exactly what will happen after that. Um, it's said that uh, Edward's mother, Elizabeth, will ask her stepbrother, uh, brother-in-law, rather, Richard, to allow uh, the younger brother, Richard, to go with his older brother into this protective custody so that they could be together, so that uh, Edward wouldn't be alone. Uh, Richard's about nine or so at the time. So these two princes will be installed, uh, imprisoned into the Tower of London ostensibly for protection. But not long after they're locked away in the Tower of London, Richard goes before Parliament and uh, pressures Parliament into declaring the marriage of Edward IV and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Woodville, as being illegitimate, as being unlawful. Edward had been betrothed to another woman before, but had decided to marry Elizabeth instead, and therefore all of their children are illegitimate as well. So Edward is now out of the running, Richard's out of the running, they're all out of the running, and as the only legitimate heir left from the uh, York family, Richard now ascends to the throne as Richard III. 
Not everybody is happy about this. There are those, uh, even his uh, own previous supporters, own, even Edward's own previous supporters, aren't terribly happy with Richard coming to the throne in this way. And of course, you also have the Lancasters who are not happy about this as well. Now, Henry VI has died, but he had had a half brother who will uh, have a son named Henry, and it is this Henry then who will contend with Richard to become the next king of England. Henry will have a lot of supporters, he'll also have a good deal of, of money, and he will be able to defeat and kill in battle Richard. And as a result, Henry will now come to the throne as the new king by virtue of uh, victory in battle more than by blood. And there is a bit of a problem with that, and Henry recognizes that. He really doesn't have a tremendous claim to the throne. His father was the illegitimate half-brother of one of the previous kings. And so in order to shore that up, Henry, Henry VII, will marry the eldest daughter of the previous king, Edward IV. So Henry VII marries Elizabeth of York, and the two of them uh, produce a number of children together. Now you'll also notice that uh, these royal marriages produce quite a number of children, as many marriages at this time do. But the population in Europe remains fairly stable, even though having large numbers of children is very common. The reason for that is that there are a lot of miscarriages, a lot of stillbirths, a lot of children that die uh, before they're two or three months old. And there are many different reasons for why that is. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, it was common practice at the time for people to try and present to the newborn child uh, something that was nice. A gift, if you will. Welcome to your new life. And one of the things that they would do is they would take a little bit of honey and uh, swirl that around into the mouth of the child so that they could have something sweet and delightful and tasty. Now, unfortunately, we know now that raw honey is not good for young children to have. It has bacteria in it that children don't have immunities to, and they can get sick and die from that. So that's just one of the many number of reasons why it is that young children are going to die early in Europe, and why it is that even though they're having 10, 12, and more children, that uh, their population remains fairly stable. So uh, Henry VII will have a number of children, and surprisingly, many of them will actually live to adulthood. His eldest son, Arthur, will become the um, Prince of Wales, uh, Wales having been fairly recently conquered by England and brought under English control. Uh, Margaret, uh, younger Henry, Elizabeth, Edward, who unfortunately dies, I believe he's about two years old when he dies, and then another Mary. Uh, these daughters will go on to marry a number of crowned heads of Europe, including the King of Scotland. And you should remember that because it will become important later. Now, Henry is a king of a very small nation state. It doesn't have control over Scotland, it doesn't have control over Ireland, it barely has control over Wales, so it's basically just England and Wales. And this is an area that doesn't have a lot of resources, if you will. It's got a lot of forests, so it's got a lot of wood and whatnot, and some of those have been cut down and made into farmlands. But by and large, England doesn't have a tremendous amount of farmland to grow massive amounts of surplus food that they can sell off and make money from. 
it uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, gold or silver, uh, precious uh, metals or um, uh, stones or that type of thing. It's a fairly poor kingdom. It's kind of a third world country. So Henry is, of course, on the lookout for a good match for his son. And a good match means that it's someone who will bring something of value into the marriage. And because this is a royal marriage, something into the kingdom. So he arranges for his son to marry one of the younger daughters of the king and queen of Spain. King and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella of Christopher Columbus fame. Uh, Spain now having secured uh, lands in the New World are now beginning to draw massive amounts of wealth from the New World. Shiploads of mostly silver but also gold and other things are being brought into Spain. Spain has become extremely wealthy now. So a match of his son with one of the daughters of the the crowned heads of Spain is a good match in that by virtue of this marriage, by virtue of the fact that they are now uh, family, they can have treaties that can be relied upon because they're family. You can rely upon family and uh, they can be military treaties, they can be economic treaties, all of this kind of thing. So it can be of great benefit to both countries. So, the young daughter, Catherine, who will have her name uh, anglicized uh, into Catherine when she becomes, uh, when she moves over into England, and she, because there are lots of different Catherines, she's known as Catherine of Aragon. Aragon was the kingdom of Spain that her mother had been queen of. Uh, she'd been queen of Aragon when she married Ferdinand, and their two kingdoms uh, combined together create Spain. So, Catherine marries Arthur, and they're both about 18 at the time. Uh, young Henry here will become important later, as he himself will also become king, Henry VIII. Young Henry is probably, I believe, about 12 at the time. And uh, Arthur and Catherine are now married. And there is no, at this time, concept of a honeymoon. But there had been recently an uprising in Wales. And as the Prince of Wales, Arthur is expected to go and put down the uprising. So he decides to take his wife along with him. And of course, their friends, her friends, his friends, and have a jolly old time as they go on uh, their merry way towards Wales to put down this uprising. So along the way, uh, there aren't a lot of inns and whatnot, so along the way they pitch up their tents and they party down. Uh, they drink, they feast, uh, they dance, and of course there is also the betting ceremony where their friends uh, hurry off the married couple into their bridal bed and see them in bed together and then they laugh and chuckle and uh, off they go knowing that the couple have been well bedded. And of course in the morning Arthur comes out and says, hey guys, I am now a man. I have done my husbandly duties. Ta-da! Today I am a man. And there's much rejoicing and happiness over the course of a uh, couple of days. And then Arthur becomes sick. And then he becomes sicker. And then he dies. Quite suddenly, quite unexpectedly. Now, Arthur had been kind of a sickly child for most of his life. But it was still unexpected. Uh, we're not sure exactly what it is that he has died from. Uh, the medical uh, facilities at that time were rather primitive, and they don't really know. And we don't really know. And so Arthur is brought back uh, to London to be mourned and uh, buried. Uh, fortunately for Henry, he does have a spare heir, young Henry, who can uh, 
now take over the role as Prince of Wales. Uh, even though young Henry had plans of his own to enter into the uh, church, not unusual for second sons to do. Many families in Europe would have their uh, second or third son enter into the clergy. It was always a good idea because, hey, you know, they're close to God and they can uh, help the family get in, if you will. And young Henry had, of course, as a um, an aristocrat, hopes that he might rise high into the church, might be a bishop, might be a cardinal, might become pope someday. But all of those are now dashed and torn apart as he now becomes the heir to the throne. Now, in normal circumstances, what was desirable on the part of both England and Spain would be for young Henry now to marry Catherine. But there's a problem with that. Because Arthur had proclaimed that he had consummated the marriage, that they had had sexual relations with one another, the marriage was bound by the church. And in the eyes of the church, therefore, Henry and Catherine are brother and sister, if you will. And it's not a good idea. You can't do that in the church for brother and sister to get together. So, a investigation had to be done. Because while Arthur claimed that they had had sexual relations, Catherine will claim that they did not. Now, the mistake may be in how each of them were told what sex was. It may have been that Arthur uh, believed that kissing would be considered sex. And certainly uh, many people in those days would have considered that to be sex. Even today, there are some people who have that belief. And of course, Catherine, being a woman, would have had to have been told something else because it's her responsibility for the children and whatnot. She would have had to have had more, shall we say, detailed explanations as to what sex was. So that could be where the disparity between sexual relations would have come between the two. But in either case, a trial had to be held to determine uh, whether or not sexual relations had taken place, whether or not the marriage had been consummated, and it will be found that it had not, and therefore the marriage could be annulled. And an annulled marriage meant that it had never occurred, and therefore Henry and Catherine could now become married. But older Henry, Henry VII, now has Catherine on the hook. He has these treaty obligations with Spain, and that's foregone. That's a conclude. That's well within his hands. And not only the um, uh, treaties with Spain, military and economic, but also the bridal dowry, which the bride brings into the marriage, and it was a sumptuous fortune, a dozen different solid silver serving platters, very large serving platters, the size of a dinner table. So it was an enormous fortune at that time that she had brought with her, and Henry wanted to keep that, and indeed still had that. But he also thought that he might be able to get a better deal somewhere else. So rather than agreeing to the marriage immediately, he will, which occurs I mean, royal marriages especially can occur at any age as long as the parents are in agreement. But this particular marriage is going to be postponed because older Henry, Henry VII, is going to proclaim that his son Henry is not yet prepared for marriage. He had been prepared for instead a uh, uh, religious life, 
and he needed to be brought up to speed, if you will. And um, that's going to take time. So Catherine and her parents agree to this. But rather than Catherine going back to live in Spain, she will instead remain in England to await for her future husband to get old enough to get married. Now, the problem is that Henry VII is going to take his time in deciding whether or not Henry is going to marry Catherine. And it is a year and then two years, and then three and four, and eventually people begin to believe that Catherine is never going to marry Henry. So a lot of courtiers, a lot of people who hang around the royal courts in hopes that they can be chummy and friendly with people, and therefore, you know, have the crumbs tossed to them, uh, maybe some land, maybe some titles, maybe uh, some money, may, you know, all kinds of things uh, that you'd hand over to friends. They no longer believe that they're going to get any of that, so they abandon Catherine, and she is left pretty much on her own. And indeed, her financial situation becomes very bad, because living in England, her parents in Spain believed that her past and future father-in-law, Henry VII, should care for her financially. Henry VII, on the other hand, said, and he was a notorious penny pincher, that she was never married to Arthur. That was clear from the courts and from the church. And she is not yet married to uh, his other son, Henry. Therefore, she is no relation to him. So he didn't feel that she was his financial responsibility. So Catherine is left in the middle of these two monarchs who don't want to have to pay. Now, occasionally some money will be sent over. Uh, occasionally Henry will uh, give some money to Catherine. They don't want to see her starve to death, certainly. But she is not going to live a lavish aristocratic lifestyle. And so she has to also reduce her uh, household as well. Many of her servants have to be dismissed. She can't afford to keep them. She's reduced down to one or two, and that's about it. So her fortunes begin to look dimmer and dimmer over the years. But she is still the potential bride to young Henry. And so she is allowed to occasionally visit him. Now, Henry, because he's now the sole heir, Edward has died. He's about two years old when he dies. Uh, the other daughters have all been married off to uh, various other crowned heads of Europe. Henry is sequestered. He's uh, kept apart from the rest of the world, and he doesn't really see very many people. The only women he's allowed to see is his nanny, an old woman and Catherine. So Catherine is, has been raised in one of the most glamorous and glittering and powerful courts in Europe for its time. And she is a very intelligent woman. She knows how to speak several different languages. She knows how to play a number of different uh, musical instruments. She is up to date on all the latest politics. She is well educated, far better educated than the vast majority of the population of Europe at the time, more than uh, uh, most men. The vast majority of men don't have her level of education, her privileges that she is afforded because of her uh, aristocratic standing. So when she comes to visit Henry, she is still young. She's in her 20s. He's in a, a teenager. She's the most beautiful woman Henry has ever seen. She's charming. She's witty. She's, she's perfect. Henry can't help but fall in love with his potential future wife. And by all accounts, they do love one another. 
So, years roll by, and eventually Henry reaches 18, and it's about this time that his father dies, suddenly, un unexpectedly. Not uncommon, again, for people at the time. And Henry now becomes the new king of England. He becomes Henry VIII. And one of the first things that Henry is going to do is he is going to marry Catherine. It's someone that he has always wanted to marry, and now as king he can do so, because no one can tell him otherwise. And their marriage, by all accounts, is a happy one. They are blessed with children. Six, unfortunately. Only one survives to adulthood. All of the others are either miscarriages or stillbirths, or the children die uh, before they're two months of age. So there are a number of problems that Henry has in his marriage, though he still loves, very deeply loves, his wife Catherine. Henry is as king, and he's still young and strong and healthy, and he is uh, inundated by a lot of women who see him as a, a way to get rich. It's not uncommon for people to do things like this. People will marry for wealth and money. Even today, people do the same sort of thing. And it was very much more common uh, at this time. So it is that Henry is presented with women who throw themselves at him. And Henry is flattered by this, and, you know, they're beautiful women, and he's king, and, you know, it's good to be the king. You, you get what you want. And, of course, there is the standard of a, a virile king who... Uh, spreads his seat out uh, amongst uh, many women. Uh, it's not uncommon for kings to have lots of illegitimate children, lots of mistresses. And Henry does. And Henry also has uh, a number of children, including males, that live. And so Henry, being a religious man, begins to worry about what's going on with his own marriage and his own legitimate children. Surely as God's loved, as God's favored, he has been chosen by God to become king of England. And in those days, people firmly believed that God intervened directly into the lives of people and rewarded those that he favored by giving them, of course, wealth. Wealth is a sure sign of God's favor because you are now able to live a nice, comfortable life, and isn't that what God would want of those that he cares for, that he loves? So wealth was considered a sure sign of God's love. Uh, if you are a king, it's even more so because you are above everybody. You have been divinely appointed by God to fill that role, that position. So everything that you do, and because God knows everything, past, present, future, he knows exactly what it is that you're going to do if you're in that position. So everything that you do is what God wants to happen. So a king is sure and certain as the head of the kingdom, head of the government, the head of uh, the people, and everything that they do is what God wants. So, how is it that Henry is being punished by not having legitimate sons, legitimate heirs to his throne? Now, a daughter can come to the throne, but it's not a good idea. Henry firmly believes it's not a good idea for a daughter to come to the throne. Remember, there had been a civil war under his father for fighting to see who would become king. 
And certainly there were individuals who claimed in England at that time that they had as much blue blood, as much royal blood flowing through their veins as Henry did, some even more, more right to sit on the throne than he did. So if a daughter were to come to the throne, a man would say, oh, a woman cannot rule. Uh, she may rule her home, but she cannot rule the kingdom. And there would be another civil war, and Henry feared that to happen. So he needed a son, a legitimate heir to the throne, who would establish with, with absolute certainty that they were the, the monarch of the kingdom. And a daughter just wasn't going to be able to quite do that. So why would God punish Henry to not have any sons through his legitimate marriage? Maybe it wasn't a legitimate marriage. Maybe the old rumors that Catherine had lied about not having sexual relations with Arthur were true that maybe she did have sexual relations with Arthur. Maybe in the eyes of the church, in the eyes of God, Catherine and Henry were brother and sister, and that this was God's punishment for this. But Henry still loved Catherine, and he was unwilling to do anything other than continue his marriage with her. That is, until he met Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn will catch Henry's eye. She was very beautiful. Henry found her very attractive, very alluring. And Henry fell head over heels in love with her. But Anne Boleyn knew how Henry operated. Henry, having had a number of mistresses before, will be very loving and caring to them until he has had his way with them, until they become pregnant, if you will. And then he basically drops them and goes on to another. Now, he doesn't abandon them. He gives them land, an income, a castle. Uh, he takes care of them. And if there is a child that's born, uh, he'll give them titles and lands as well. He, he will care for them. He'll take care of them. But he's tired and he moves on to something new, something different. And he's done this a number of times. In fact, Anne Boleyn's own sister had been someone that Henry had been with and that Henry had fathered an illegitimate son with. So when Henry saw Anne, he saw a woman who was beautiful and he saw a woman who could bear sons. And she will also drive Henry near insanity by refusing his overtures, whereas other women wouldn't refuse Henry. She instead says no to him. No, you're a married man. No, I cannot have relations with you. No, leave me alone. I am saving myself for my husband only. For Henry, that was just maddening. To say no to the king is something that n almost never happens. And for a woman to say that to, to a man, there are some men, and even indeed some women, who if you tell them no, they will be all the more uh, wanting that individual. It becomes a challenge for them, perhaps. But in either case, for Henry, it was maddening for her to say no to him. And so he uh, just is driven near insanity. He writes love letters to her. He sends her expensive jewelry. They're all returned to him. But Henry knows that if they were to just be together, they could have sons who would be brave and strong and true and rule the world. So he decides maybe he should divorce his wife after all. Even though he loves her, he knows that uh, for the betterment of the kingdom, and also because, hey, she's a hot new young babe, he needs to get a divorce. 
So he will appeal to the church to grant him a divorce based on Catherine's uh, having lied and that uh, Arthur and Catherine had real, well and truly been married and that Henry and Catherine's marriage should never have happened in the first place so that it could be annulled, which means that uh, their children would be illegitimate and Catherine will have been living in sin, and that would not be a very good thing for her family, who it would reflect very badly upon. And at this particular moment, the Pope in Rome had had an argument with the King of Spain, not Ferdinand, who had died, and I believe uh, it was one of his grandsons who will now be uh, on the throne and he had sent a military force to Rome and had captured the Pope. And if the Pope were to agree to annul this marriage, it would be a very bad thing for the Spanish royal family. And it's not unusual for Popes to die suddenly, accidentally falling down a flight of stairs, falling down repeatedly upon a sword, accidents happen. And as a result, uh, the Pope will not do what Popes normally do when a king asks them to do something, which is to immediately say, yeah, okay, you're king, you're God's favored, not a problem, there you go. Instead, he will proclaim that a trial had to be held to determine the truth of the matter. And of course, this was going to take a good deal of time, maybe years. And in that time, eventually the King of Spain might withdraw his troops because it's very expensive to maintain troops. So cut down on expenses, he might withdraw his, his forces back to Spain. And then the Pope, the church itself, could then proclaim a divorce for Henry. But Henry was unwilling to wait. And he will now begin to listen to some of his courtiers, some of his counselors in court, who will tell him that there are developments in Europe. The Protestant Reformation is taking place. Now, Henry had refused them before. He had been a very strong supporter of the Roman Catholic Church all of his life and was really kind of surprised about the events that were taking place in Europe with the Protestant Reformation. And so when his counselors had advised him that perhaps England should become a Protestant kingdom, he said no. But now it was beginning to look like a pretty good idea because if he brought Protestantism into England. He could not only purify the church, cleanse it, make it better, and therefore God would be pleased with him. He could also then become now the head of the English church, the Anglican church, and as the head of the church, he could push for his divorce, grant his divorce. Now, he could marry Anne and start proceeding to have legitimate sons. And in addition to that, he could also seize all of the Roman Catholic lands in England, greatly enriching himself, thus proving that this is what God wanted after all. So, for religious reasons, for financial reasons, for dynastic reasons, for lots of different reasons, Henry will break with the Roman Catholic Church, bring in the Protestant Church, and there will be those who will um, try and keep him from doing this. Uh, very famous stories. I'm not going to get into those. I'll let you read through those. Uh, but eventually, Henry will get his way and the Church of England will be developed. He'll grant himself a divorce, and he'll now be able to marry Anne Boleyn. And he is rewarded for this, and will quickly become pregnant. 
and of course there is great expectations that she will have a son. It's not too long after this that for various different reasons, Catherine will pass away. Probably from a broken heart. But in either case, Anne will give birth and Henry, fully expecting a son, will instead be a bit disappointed with uh, another daughter. But hey, it's only their first child. They can have many others. And so Henry's not too displeased. And not too long after, Anne becomes pregnant again. And of course, there's great joy and happiness until a few months later, there's a miscarriage. And at this point, Henry begins to greatly worry because he's gone through this before. He knows that this is not his fault. He's king of England. He's divinely appointed by God. God would never do anything bad to Henry. It must be on Anne. And so he begins to listen to rumors that have been circulating around the court about Anne. Anne has lots of enemies. Anne is not exactly a peacemaker. She's a very abrasive personality. She's queen. You better do what she tells you to do. And in addition, there were still individuals in court who liked Catherine very much and didn't like this Anne at all. And so they began to circulate rumors about her. And Henry now, because of a daughter, because of a miscarriage, begins to wonder if, again, God is telling him something. So he opens up a trial in order to determine what exactly is going on. And there will be presented evidence by individuals who will proclaim that they had had sex with Anne, men who were not her husband having sex with her, now, it's okay for the king to go off and have relations because as a man, you know, spread your seed and that kind of thing. But for a woman, it's bad because there's no way to determine who the father of that child is. There's no paternity test. So a man could wind up having to care for some other man's children. And so a woman having relations outside of marriage, it is far worse in their eyes at that time. Well, in any case, uh, these men will confess to having had sex with Anne, but they will have confessed to this under torture. And of course, later they will recant their confessions. But that will be discounted because they will have given their confessions in court, and that's what mattered, nothing else. So Anne is found guilty of having relations outside of her marriage. And there were even accusations of her having uh, committed witchcraft as well. Uh, evidence of that was, of course, that she had been uh, seen playing cards and of course cards can be used as tarot cards which are witchcraft and of course how else could she have uh, induced Henry to divorce his wife Catherine and marry her except through witchcraft so Anne is found guilty but this is a very unusual circumstance because her husband is the head of the government so she has, in effect, done treason. And the penalty for treason is death. Now, if she were a, a commoner, a peasant, the punishment for treason would be that she would be hanged until mostly dead, and then brought down, and then the genitals if you male, the male genitalia would be removed and roasted before them, 
females the breast would be cut off roasted before them and then their limbs would be drawn to horses and pulled off if they weren't pulled off they would then be hacked off and then they would be dragged over and have their head cut off and then their head would be boiled in a mixture that would uh, help to preserve it so that it could then be placed on a spike and then uh, it would be presented before the city, uh, people would, you know, be marched down the street and then presented in front of the gate uh, for a good deal of time for people to see what happens to people who are traitors. Aristocrats, on the other hand, uh, who were guilty of treason, only had their heads cut off. So this is what Anne faced, execution by having her head cut off. However, the axemen in England were very notorious, very bad at their jobs. There are a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is that most people got most of their fluid intake from alcohol. The reason for that, of course, is that uh, there weren't a lot of freshwater sources available that were clean, that didn't uh, have pollution in it, either human feces or animal feces or runoff from uh, various different industries or all of this type of thing, even wells. I mean, people generally, there were no public uh, toilet facilities and people would do their business uh, beside um, in the buildings, in alleyways, out in the open. So all of that would run into the groundwater, and so even wells could be polluted. Most people, uh, after they'd been weaned, would begin to drink uh, very low alcoholic content, alcoholic beverages. And that would generally kill off the bacteria, and it would be filtered, and all of that type of thing. So most people were, you know, slightly tipsy most of the time. Uh... In addition, an axeman, while it was a good paying position, and indeed even the, uh, they would earn extra income. They would be allowed the clothing, for example, of those who were being executed. So, and they could sell that off, secondhand clothing. And for aristocrats, they would have very expensive clothing. So you could make a good deal of money that way. But most people, would avoid becoming a, an executioner because even though they were performing a service for the government, it was still killing someone. So in the eyes of the church, it's not a good thing. Now you could be forgiven for it because of course, you know, you can ask for forgiveness and of course you're doing a, a good thing for the state and all of that type of thing. But nonetheless, it isn't something that people are going to be drawn to voluntarily. And instead, most axemen come from the prisons. And usually, these are individuals who themselves are faced with execution. You can either become an executioner, or you can be executed yourself. So there's no training for this. There's, uh, and they're often a, a bit inebriated. Uh, they're not terribly happy about this job. Plus the axe itself, which is usually a ceremonial axe. It's not terribly well balanced. It's unwieldy. And it's, n it's very, very common for an, uh, an axeman to take multiple swings to remove the head. And even then, often they'll have to resort to what was known as a gristle knife, the very last pieces of ligament that tied the head to the shoulders would have to be cut off with a very sharp knife. So it's a very bloody, very a painful, just horrible execution method. Indeed, when the French Revolution comes along, uh, the guillotine was hailed as a very humane way of killing people, uh, far preferable to that of the axeman. The, uh, uh, the blade coming down very swiftly, lopping off the head in one, one go, and very much less painful. 
Henry still had kind of a soft spot for Anne, and so out of his own pocket, out of his own expense, he will hire a professional swordsman, a man who had a reputation of taking a person's head off in one clean stroke. And so that's what will happen with Anne. But uh, Henry, now a widower, needs a wife. The kingdom needs a queen. And as a result, Henry will find another woman, a very lovely woman. Again, you can find images, pictures that have been drawn of each of Henry's wives, painted of, of them. Uh, you can find normally in the classroom setting, I will show these images. But again, here I'm not able to do so. I will hopefully have you do that on your own. Very easy for you to do, looking for uh, these individuals' pictures. Jane Seymour, Henry will now marry. And she's a very lovely woman, very, very nice. And very quickly after having been married, uh, she will bear a son. Henry is quite ecstatic about this, quite happy about this. Unfortunately, within a few days, Jane Seymour dies. And she dies from something that a lot of women, it was very common for women to die from at that time. It was what was known as childbed fever, a bacterial infection that uh, results in sepsis that creates a very high fever and blood poisoning and dies within a few days. Very common because either the midwife or the physician who will be assisting in the birth of the child knew absolutely nothing of uh, germs. And so they don't uh, clean their hands when they're doing all of this. And so the bacteria, the germs will move off of their hands into the woman and it it leads to many women dying. Very common at that time. But Henry now has a son, Edward. But it's always good to have a spare because, hey, you never know what's going to happen. And Henry is still fairly young. He's getting a little older. He's getting a little slower. And, of course, the kingdom needs a queen. So, into this come some of his uh, courtiers, some of his hangers-on, some of his so-called friends. One of them will tell Henry of a beautiful German princess. Oh, she's lovely. You're going to love her, Henry. Uh, a woman by the name of Anne. She's in the uh, German principality of Cleves. Great woman. But Henry says, you know, I've never met her before. I don't know what she looks like. I'd kind of like to know what she looks like before I agree to marry her. So he sends a court painter to go and paint her portrait. And the portrait is brought back, and Henry looks at it and says, eh, she's not bad. Okay, sure, it's on. Let's get her. When Anne arrives, however, she is not as painted. She is not quite up to what Henry would like. Now, she's not ugly. Um, and and certainly she was uh, not viewed as, as ugly by the people of the court, but she was kind of plain, let's say. Not what Henry really wanted. But he'd already agreed to marry her. All the guests had arrived, the party had been set up, all of that type of thing. So he goes and marries her. But he's not romantically interested in her. But they spend time together, and Henry finds that uh, she's a very nice person. He likes her. They become chummy. They become good friends. And so eventually Henry divorces her. But in a reverse of what usually happens today, where you bring in a nanny to take care of the kids, and the husband says, hey, she's good looking, uh, and uh, he divorces his wife and marries the nanny, in this case, Henry will divorce his wife and make her his nanny for his other children, and she will take over raising these children. She'll be given uh, lands and a home and uh, income and, and all of that type of thing, and she'll be well cared for. But Henry is uh, no longer 
uh, married and uh, the kingdom no longer has a queen and so something you know he goes off and finds someone else and then in this case henry finds a woman by the name of catherine howard now catherine is a cousin of anne boleyn so she has that boleyn look if you will and henry likes her a lot now at the time Catherine had been seeing another man. She was going to marry him, and she really didn't want to marry Henry, who is now getting a bit older. Uh, he's uh, putting on more weight. He's in uh, poorer health than he had been before. So he's not exactly the charming bachelor kind of guy. But he is king of England. He is rich, and... Uh, Catherine Howard's father convinces her to marry him because once she is queen, then the family is going to receive royal favors, wealth, all of this kind of stuff. So it would be good for the family. But Catherine isn't really in love with Henry, and she's uh, young, and Henry isn't, and Henry... Uh, spends more time sleeping than with her. She has a lot of t time on her own, and she eventually will have rumors circulating around that she is spending far too much time with men on her own. And eventually, Henry, saddened by these rumors, uh, opens up a trial to determine the truth of this, and people will confess to, again, under torture, but they will nonetheless confess that uh, they had had sexual relations with her. And most historians believe that unlike with Anne Boleyn, where all of the individuals will later recant their confessions, that uh, Catherine really did have relations outside of her marriage. But again, she is found guilty of treason, and the sentence is execution. And she is executed by the axeman. Henry, this time, will not expend his own money in order to have an easy death for her. And she doesn't have an easy death. It takes more than a couple of whacks before her head is cleaved off. So it's not a terribly pleasant execution. But now, again, Henry is a widower. The kingdom no longer has a queen, so Henry looks elsewhere for another bride. And he finds a lovely young woman who, again, is um, in a relationship with another man. She wants to marry this other man, but again, she is convinced by her family to marry Henry, uh, and they are married. And Fortunately for Catherine Parr, Henry dies within a few months of their marriage before Henry can be um, fall out of love with her, if you will. And now Catherine, now that she is a widow, can go off and marry the man that she was in love with before. Uh, this time now she is, she has wealth that she can bring into the family because is you know one time queen. She's got you know stuff. She's got money. And in normal fairy tales, that's where the tale would end off. They would go riding off into the sunset. But this is history. And that, and we all know, nobody lives forever. And she is going to die. What is going to happen is that she, too, will die from childbed fever. She'll give birth to a child, die from childbed fever. And that's how her story ends. So it's there is there aren't many happy endings for a, a lot of people in the past. Eh, whether there are nowadays is debatable. At any rate, so with the death of Henry VIII, his only son, living son, Edward, becomes the new king of England. But he's very young. I think he's like 10 or something. Interestingly, uh, there is a rhyme that is told to speak of the six wives of Henry and how they ended. Divorced, beheaded, died, 
divorced, beheaded, survived. Edward becomes king, but he is not old enough to rule on his own, and so members of his family, I believe it's his uncle, who will have to rule uh, until he's old enough to be able to do so. And uh, when he is 18 and just about to rule on his own, he suddenly dies. And again, we're not really sure how it is that he dies. There are a number of possibilities. But with his death, there is a serious problem. Who is going to rule after him? Certainly there are no other legitimate male heirs alive from uh, Henry VIII's line to take over. But there are daughters, the eldest of which is Mary. And rather than face an English civil war, rather than having armies clash against one another, destroying uh, cities and uh, rape, rob, uh, pillage, plunder, murder, all of this type of stuff taking place, they all decide that Mary should become queen. So Henry VIII's fears that there would be civil war over Mary are, in the end, unfounded. But certainly it was a real fear that Henry had at the time. Mary, however, has been raised Catholic. And so when she comes to the throne, she comes to the throne as a Catholic monarch. And the kingdom must follow the monarch. And so the kingdom now converts back from Protestantism back into Roman Catholicism. Not everybody is happy about this. And again, there are individuals who will refuse to convert. These individuals are denounced as heretics, burnt at the stake. Their lands, titles are stripped from them. There are those who will refuse to convert and will flee England. And there are those who will refuse to convert, but in public, they will proclaim that they are Roman Catholic. In private, they will continue to practice their Protestantism. Of course, if they are found out, they will be denounced as heretics and burnt at the stake. Which is why Mary's reign is why why Mary is sometimes referred to as bloody Mary. Mary will realize that she will need to produce heirs to the throne, so she'll marry. But before she can produce children, she will herself die. I believe it's from cancer, uh, stomach cancer, very painful for her. Uh, there was some hope at the beginning that it might just simply be that she was pregnant. Uh, these were uh, early uh, signs of uh, her pregnancy, but it will be, it will not. At her death, again, the kingdom will decide that rather than having civil war, they will accept Henry VIII's next daughter, Elizabeth, as Queen of England. Elizabeth comes to the throne, and she has been raised Protestant. So again, the kingdom swings back to Protestantism. Those who were Catholic, however, can continue to practice their Catholicism, as long as it is not practiced within five miles of a city. And they cannot hold public office, and they cannot be officers in the military. So there are restrictions, but you can continue to live your life. You can continue to have your property and all of that type of stuff. So she's not considered to be bloody Elizabeth because of that. But there are those who want to continue to practice their Catholicism, and some, again, will leave England to uh, be allowed to freely practice their religion. Now, Elizabeth is known as the Virgin Queen because she never marries. She does have a number of close male companions, and whether or not uh, things happened uh, 
we're not sure, but certainly uh, there were uh, close males that she will uh, be very friendly with, and at least one that I'm aware of who will eventually wind up being executed. But she has no children, and as a result, what is going to happen at her death is that the powers that be in England will have to look back further. Henry VIII's sisters, the eldest of which had married the King of Scotland. It is through that line then that the next King of England will be chosen. Now, interestingly enough, the daughter of the union of the King of Scotland and of uh, this woman was a woman by the name of Mary, Mary, Queen of Scots, who Elizabeth had executed. There's a long story about that, too, and if you want to learn more about it, you are free to do so in a research paper, perhaps. But in either case, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? That Mary. She will have married and had produced a son, James. And it is James that the throne of England will be offered to. Now, James will have also been king of Scotland. So when he comes to the throne in England, he is both king of Scotland and king of England. And it is there that we will leave the story uh, and pick it up next time when we will begin to talk about the English Civil War. All right. Thank you.